Okay. So let's get more into specific details here. So grunge.com, of all places, has an interesting write-up here, The Biggest Brandon Swanson Theories, What Really Happened, by Jennifer Dushman, October 22nd, 2021, was the date of this article. On May 13th, 2008, 19-year-old Brandon Swanson completed his first year at Minnesota West Community and Technical College. Later that same evening, he and his friends were celebrating at a home in Canby, where they were also having a send-off party for one of their classmates. According to witness reports, there was alcohol at the party, and Swanson had at least one shot of whiskey. However, as reported by the True Crime Files, Swanson's friends said he did not appear to be intoxicated when he left the party just after midnight, May 14th. Swanson reportedly planned to drive from Canby to his parents' home in Marshall. The drive would have taken around 30 minutes. At approximately 1.15 a.m., Swanson's vehicle got stuck in a ditch. The True Crime Files reports he initially attempted to call his friends for help. However, nobody answered his calls. At approximately 1.54 a.m., Swanson called his parents and told them his car was stuck in a ditch off a gravel road. However, he was not entirely certain of his location. During the call, Swanson assured his parents he was not hurt and that he would wait with, the, with his car. However, when Brian and Annette Swanson arrived at their son's expected location, they could not see him or his vehicle. As reported by True Crime Files, Brandon and his par parents agreed to flash headlights in an attempt to find each other. Unfortunately, they still could not see each other. Brandon Swanson was on the phone with his father when he vanished without a trace. Brandon Swanson said he could see lights in the distance, which he believed were coming from the town of Lind. He told his parents he would walk the rest of the way and meet them in a parking lot of a Lind tavern. Brian said he stayed on the phone with his son while he was walking. As reported by True Crime Files, Swanson planned to take a shortcut through some fields as opposed to staying on the main road. During the call, he told his father he passed several fences and gravel roads. He could also hear water running in the distance. Brian said he and his son talked for approximately 47 minutes before Brandon exclaimed, Oh, expletive, and the call was abruptly dropped. Brian said there was nothing after that. Brian believes his son may have slipped and fallen. Another point here, some people believe like he could have maybe been shot by somebody for trespassing and they covered it up, but apparently the he, how would that gunshot not be heard? You would think it would be heard unless it happened at a moment, because it said that they were dropped. The service was not excellent here. So there were dropped calls and stuff, so they had to call each other back prior to that, though. But this is a 47-minute call. I mean, some calls have dead spots. It would be curious to know if this call... I mean, everybody's been on the phone where, I mean, sometimes you have up to 5 to 10 seconds of just dead air and you can't hear the other person. So unless a gunshot or some kind of scuffle occurred at that time, it seems like his father would have heard something. The other thing I want to point out here is that, so this is a guy talking on his phone, so if there was some kind of criminal-minded individual out there looking to kill somebody, they would have heard him from a pretty decent distance if he's talking on the phone while walking. So that would bring attention to him, that otherwise just a random person walking in the middle of the night through fields might not necessarily be heard from someone from a distance if they're not talking and just walking normally, depending, of course, on how crunchy the ground is or whatever. Either way, talking on a phone, particularly if you're in an agitated state and the connection is bad, maybe he's talking a little louder than normal, but either way, someone would be able to hear him at a certain distance that otherwise they might not. I think that's an important point to keep in mind. Brian and Annette attempted to call their son back numerous times. However, their calls were never answered. By the following morning, the calls were going directly to voicemail. The True Crime Files reports Brian and Annette continued driving around looking for their son, but they did not find any signs of him or his car. At 6.30 a.m., they called authorities to file a missing persons report. However, authorities said to wait, and it is not unusual for his men his age to go missing without contacting their parents. I mean, a 19-year-old, are you going to call a 19-year-old a man? I mean, maybe a young man. I mean, a 19-year-old's a kid. Brandon Swanson's vehicle was located, but he was never found.
Later that same morning, a review of Swanson's cell phone records revealed he was just outside Porter, Minnesota while he was talking to his parents. The town he saw in the distance could not have been Lind, as he was 25 miles away from where he thought he was. True Crime Files reports he was walking along Highway 68 between Canby, where he attended the party, and Marshall, where his parents lived. Okay, I just had another thought here, too. Is it possible something traumatic happened at the party? Not necessarily that the friends were involved in disposing of him, although, who knows, because uh, how would they have found him? But if something happened, he could have been in a, in a certain state of mind. I mean, you would think his parents would have picked up on that, but maybe not, because what state of, would he normally be confused about where he was if he's from this area? I mean, I don't know. Like, obviously, if somebody's distressed or drunk, I mean, or was he really just that drunk, but he's able to cover it up in conversation? I mean, I don't know. A 19, would a 19-year-old be able to do that? I mean, someone older, obviously, with experience doing that for many years. I mean, there are people that can do that. Would a 19-year-old kid be able to do that? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of questions here. But if he was in some kind, some kind of state of mind, might have con he had to have been in order to not know where he was. Unless, of course, he's faking this as his disappearance, but... If the friends were involved in helping him fake his disappearance, would they say he wasn't drunk? I mean, I don't know what to make of that either, but... True Crime Files reports he was walking along Highway 68 between Canby, where he attended the party, and Marshall, where his parents lived. Authorities began their official search for Swanson shortly before noon. At approximately 12.30 p.m., his Chevrolet Lumina was found in a ditch on the borders of Lincoln and Yellow Medicine, just over a mile from Taunton. Lincoln County Sheriff's Jack Vizaki said the vehicle was positioned in a way that Swanson would not be able to get any traction to get out of the ditch. However, as reported by the True Crime Files, there was no visible damage to the vehicle and no signs that Swanson was injured in the incident. In the months following his disappearance, law enforcement personnel and volunteers searched the region on horseback, on foot, and using all-terrain vehicles. They also utilized search dogs and scoured several bodies of water. Unfortunately, no trace of the missing man was ever found. As reported by the True Crime Files, the search dogs led their handlers to the edge of Yellow Medicine River, which caused authorities to conclude that Swanson likely fell in the river. But I mean, the other the other source was saying that the dog picked up the search uh, that sent again on the other side and continued elsewhere, and disappeared not in a body of water. Authorities believe Brandon Swanson fell into a river. I mean, did they really though? As the river was searched and Brandon Swanson's body was never found, the authorities believe he made it back out of the water and continued walking. However, he likely died of hypothermia as the temperature was just 40 degrees that morning. They do not believe foul play was involved. The True Crime Files reports the search dogs also indicated that there were human remains near Mud Creek north of Porter. However, authorities never actually found any remains. So this is kind of weird. So how thorough of a search did they do? Because without knowing that, like if this was truly an absolutely thorough search, I mean, did they even use ground penetrating radar or whatever? Because if the dogs, I mean, is there more than one dog? It says here, search dogs, uh, plural, indicated that there were human remains. So only, apparently only one dog picked up the track or led the track into the river and then out. But were multiple dogs hitting on remains near Mud Creek? And they searched it very well and the body wasn't there? So does that mean a body was there and it was there for a certain period of time and then moved? Is it possible he really did die of hypothermia and he fell there someone, and then someone just took the body and moved it for whatever reason? Either a psychopath, maybe a landowner that didn't want to be sued. I mean, I would think they would have investigated that, but who knows. So someone who wasn't responsible for his death in any way, but simply moved the body for whatever reason. Does that explain the hits with the dogs and yet the body not being there? Hmm. I mean, this, this is curious. It's definitely curious. I mean, the temperature does match up with hypothermia. And if we believe that initial dog track and he did fall into the river, then got out of it, walked a certain portion. Because, I mean, it seems like they really did do a thorough search of that river. I mean, they installed gates and all that. So, yeah, it's, it's hard to believe that they wouldn't have, unless they're all completely incompetent, but... 
Authorities said Swanson could be anywhere within a 122 square mile area. Well, that's weird. Why, why not 123? Ten years after Swanson vanished, Yellow Medicine County Sheriff Bill Flated said it's a huge area. If you take that immediate area where the car was and then the time frame when he was walking on the phone with his parents, who knows what direction he went and how far he traveled. Volunteer firefighter Darren E. Delzer said he has another theory about what happened to Swanson based on several things he noted about the case. In response to an article by Angelo Marcos, Delzer said Swanson was legally blind in his left eye and always wore glasses. However, on the morning he went missing, he left his glasses inside his car. I mean, this is a really important detail. It's weird how it's not even on the wiki. Delzer also noted that Swanson said, not another fence, right before saying, oh, expletive. Another interesting detail. Delzer suggested the teen may have fallen into an unmarked cistern or well, which are not uncommon in rural areas. But I mean, come on, how many of those really are there? Because if, if they match up with the dog track, again, if the dog track is wrong, okay, whatever. But let's assume that the dog track is accurate first. Can they really not search all of the fences and cisterns and wells just, just in the area of the dog track first? And if they did do that and he's not there, then expand it to other wells and cisterns in the area. I mean, how many could there really be? I mean, even if there are hundreds, I mean, it's been years. Other theories about Brandon Swanson's disappearance. Another theory suggests Brandon Swanson may have orchestrated his own disappearance. As explained by Minnesota's Unsolved Cases, it is possible that the teen left the area on his own and is now living under a new identity. However, it is not likely. As he had attempted to call his friends and was attempting to meet up with his parents, it is far more likely that he wanted to be found. It has also been suggested that Swanson may have had some kind of mental breakdown. However, his parents both said he seemed to be lucid when they spoke with him on the phone, and he did not have any history of mental illness. The theory that he fell into the water and either made it back out or drowned also has been criticized, as his phone seemed to be working after the call with his father was disconnected. Minnesota's Unsolved reports that if the phone were submerged in water, all of the calls would have gone directly to voicemail. Although it is plausible that the phone fell on the ground while F Swanson fell in the water, it was never found near any of the bodies of water in the region. Although he may have sought shelter in an abandoned building, most, if not all, of the abandoned buildings in the area were searched, and neither his remains nor his personal belongings were ever found. And then they go on to talk about Brandon's Law, which we already went over. Okay, I have another theory here. I don't know if I'm going to dub this the McGuire Theory. I don't know if anybody's ever thought of this, but he, here's my initial thought right now after reading all of this new information about the uh, that he's blind or legally blind or partially blind in the left eye and doesn't have his glasses. If he did injure himself on a fence and fell or something, possibly enough to knock him unconscious or at least incapacitate him to the point where he where he couldn't grab the phone or didn't think to grab the phone, is it possible... Now, again, I'm not saying he was attacked. I mean, that's another theory because if he was attacked at that point, I mean, you would think there would be something heard. But here's, here's what I'm going to dub the McGuire theory in the Brandon Swanson case. If he injured himself by falling, either in the water, I mean, yeah, the cell phone not being recovered, I mean, that's tough. But whether he fell in the water, then got out or not, or simply fell next to a fence and either hit himself on a rock or whatever... If another party, possibly a criminal-minded party, stumbled upon an injured individual, this could have been an hour later, so the phone is not on now. Or even a half an hour. I mean, they stayed on the phone for however many minutes before hanging up and trying to call again. So, And, and I'm assuming they continued calling throughout the night, but either way, that phone could have been taken by a criminal-minded individual who also took an injured human being. Perhaps there's a certain population of criminal-minded scumbags. Perhaps they're too cowardly to attack people under normal circumstances. Perhaps there are serial killers more of the scavenger mindset that would only act on their sinister urges on an injured party. So if they find this injured teenager, 
what would they do? An extension of this theory is perhaps if a good Samaritan stumbled upon him, you would think they would take the call, the phone, call police or whatever. They wouldn't just try to help him. I mean, that's that's more of an outlier theory because unless, let's, I mean, even if, if they were a good Samaritan who happened to be a criminal and didn't want to have anything to do with police or maybe some kind of tax evading cheat, a nonviolent criminal, would they not contact? I mean, it still seems like they would drop him off at a hospital or something. But so it seems unlikely that they would have had him first and then another evil third party would have got him. But on the basic level of this theory, did he injure himself and did another individual somehow do something to him after he injured himself taking the phone with him? Because if Brandon himself was trying to crawl out of there, wouldn't the phone... It, it seems like the phone should have been recovered at some point through all these searches. Unless he got really, really far outside of the search area, how plausible is that? I mean, I don't know. But that that's the McGuire theory I'm outlining here in the Brandon Lawson case. Perhaps he got injured, and only due to that... Or per, was he being tracked? I mean, some serial killers love to operate off of roads particularly on uh, disabled motorists, motorists with disabled vehicles. Did they follow him from the road? So this is 2008. I'm going to drop another Echelon Spy Satellite System reference because this is 2008 and not 1970. Obviously, a lot of these spy agencies, the NSA, all these other agencies, they do have spy satellite systems. Obviously, they work with other agencies and, and third-party satellite companies, etc. But they clearly monitor pretty much all of the United States, 24-7 surveillance. So wouldn't they be able to find something now? It was dark, okay, yeah, sure, but they could at least trace him from the party to a certain area, and they could at least uh, zoom out a little bit to maybe track all the vehicles that were in the area. Because if, if there was another party involved, they might be able to track vehicles and at least rule them out. I'm not alleging that the satellites would be able to monitor activities, you know, under the tree line or whatever. But in terms of vehicles and tracing movements, I mean, it would still be very, very helpful. Also, looking at some of these photos of the searches, I mean, the grass is, I mean, the grass and these fields are really tall. I mean, they're almost as tall as a person. So you could see how he might not be found by a human, but with all the dogs searching, you would think they'd pick it up. And over so many years, I mean, it, it does seem like it's not unreasonable that they wouldn't have found him immediately just due to the nature of the terrain. But with this many dogs employed and, and so many searches over the years, it seems like they should have found him by now. Unless there were private properties that didn't allow searches. I mean, I don't see a record of that anywhere. So, if there was, that'd be curious. I mean, in the Brandon Lawson case, supposedly there was a landowner possibly connected to the sheriff who uh, did not allow his property to be searched, which is nearby. But that doesn't make sense either because supposedly... They found remains with the clothes that Brandon was wearing, but they were helicopter flyovers that went over all the properties. So that doesn't make a lot of sense in the Brandon Lawson case. I talk about that on that podcast, so you can check that out if you want more information on that. And they did helicopter flyovers here as well, although that would be less helpful than a desert because here we have these extensive fields of tall grass. So if he had fallen in the field, he wouldn't necessarily be viewable from helicopter. Other reports state that the Yellow Medicine River is between knee-deep in some areas and 15 feet deep in others. So it didn't really have a uniform depth. So 15 feet area, I mean, obviously that's super dangerous. But if it's only knee-high, if he's not drunk, it seems like he would not have drowned in that situation. Also, from some of these photos, it does look like there are some really big drop-offs. In certain areas, I mean, not quite cliffs, but clearly, I mean, 10 to 20 foot drop areas where you, if you don't, at night and you don't see where you're going, it's just a drop. And I mean, it's, some of it's right into the river, some of it's near the river. But again, these supposedly, all the areas of the river were searched, so. And if, especially if he was injured in some kind of fall, how far could he have gotten on his own? Does the McGuire theory come into play where a third party possibly did something to an injured Brandon Swanson. 
Also, another theory people bring up is that he, he Brandon took shelter in some kind of an outbuilding of a random farmer. Now, people discount this theory because they would think that the farmer would eventually find him in their outbuilding. Now, here's a darker theory. What if some of these farmers, what if one of them had some kind of evil intentions and he did something to Brandon, in which case he would never come forward? So how thoroughly have all of these farm owners been investigated? Again, there's nothing really to suggest they did anything, but has it been ruled out? I mean, after all these years, we do need to expand and start thinking in, in more than one direction. Yet another theory, if he did stumble into an outbuilding and died of hypothermia, would a farmer really come forward? Like, let's say they find him already dead. They don't want to be liable. He died on their property. I mean, in an age where burglars are suing homeowners for houses they're burglarizing and winning lawsuits, I mean, is it beyond the realm of possibility that one of these farmers, they just might have just not wanted the trouble and they disposed of the dead body? They found, they found a dead kid in one of their buildings. What would they do? After thinking about that, actually, just now, though, I think I might have to call that the McGuire theory. That seems a little bit more plausible than some random psycho. Although, I mean, I don't know exactly how much more plausible. Obviously, we don't know what happened. So hindsight's, of course, twenty twenty, and the body hasn't been recovered yet, and we don't know what happened to him yet. So... Yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough, but I think, I think I might have to call that the McGuire theory instead, that a farmer found Swanson either on their property somewhere or in one of their buildings and just didn't want the headache, and it's as simple as that. Now, on the paranormal side, just for a brief moment, if there's some kind of interdimensional rift and he fell into some kind of interdimensional wormhole and the phone was either left behind or taken with him, the the only thing I could see that points to that is if there was absolutely no noise on the phone. Because when you drop a phone, I mean, there could be a rustle from the leaves nearby or whatever, or just the phone bounces a few times, animal noises, I mean, wind noises. Was it completely dead silent? And if so, I mean, was the phone broken at some point? Like, if it... If part of the phone got damaged, that could be a non-paranormal explanation if there was no noise at all. But I don't know if the parents were ever asked if there was any kind of noises. They just said that Brandon wasn't speaking. So, and then the father said that it sounded like he tripped and fell. I don't know what that means. Um, that was his impression, or he specifically heard some kind of a stumble? But then what was heard after that, if anything... Another theory is that he said, oh, expletive, because maybe he saw some headlights, so he was going to run to a car. If he's, uh, if he's taking a shortcut, there's a fence, and the road is a little bit of a distance away, would he yell, oh, expletive, as if, oh, look, there's a car, I'm going to go get help, and he rushes after the car, and then he gets hurt, falls, whatever, and he's not able to make it. Or if he did fall into the river at that point... I mean, where's the phone, though? <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's rough. I mean, if they really searched well, you would think they would have searched well where the dogs were. So if the dogs really didn't have his scent, then okay, the phone might still be out there somewhere. But you would think if the dogs really did have his scent, they would have picked up the phone. Now, if Brandon lost the phone and then stumbled into some outbuilding for shelter while he was dying of hypothermia, would the farm owner who possibly disposed of him, he might actually go out and make sure that he didn't drop anything so it wouldn't be found. So if he did find the phone and confiscated it, I mean, that's my new McGuire theory right there. Because out of all the farm owners in the U.S., are, there, there's, got, there's got to be at least one that would do something like that. Now, whether or not that happened in this case, again, I'm not saying that it happened. I'm just saying that's one theory that might explain why he hasn't been found or his phone might not have been found. So other people speculate that he really was drunk and that's why he was taking back roads. Also, he visited at, at minimum two parties. So he might have been more, but I believe people, the witnesses said he was at two different parties. So he's party hopping. And did he really just get confused? Or is he taking back roads to avoid a possible DUI? And that's why he even went off the road into a ditch, because he was drunk. Or maybe on some kind of drugs that wouldn't cause him to slur. 
if that's the case, and these roads are really poorly lit, so, hmm, I mean, definitely curious there, definitely curious. Another interesting detail I found on Reddit, um, supposedly, there were cadaver dogs that hit two to four miles from his last position, according to the cell phone data. And the searcher said that the dogs hit on a piece of farm equipment. And it was near one of the fields, but that particular farmer did not give them permission to do anything further. Now, the plausible deniability aspect comes in here because all of these extensive searches uh, might ruin the crops and the farmland. Now, there is a particular time of year where it wouldn't, so it's not clear whether, why wouldn't he give them permission on a part of year, you know, there's at least several weeks a year where, where they're not actively doing crop work or whatever that could possibly do a search without too much damage, but uh, it's unclear whether this permission was ever given. And if the dogs really did hit on a piece of farm equipment, what does that mean? Was a piece of farm equipment used to maybe bury the body or something? I mean, that's kind of weird. And this information is about a year old. Some people speculate that the farmer simply shot him, but maybe not. I already, uh, already went over that. But in the McGuire theory, perhaps he actually went up to a farm owner and talked to him. And then who knows what happened after that. Other people further speculate that perhaps the farmer might have been involved in some kind of illegal activity, drug activity, whatever, and having some kids stumble upon it. Again, nobody's saying these things are likely. I mean, these are definitely unlikely scenarios, but how do we know that this unlikely scenario isn't what happened to Brandon Swanson? That's something that cons the coincidence theorists really have a hard time with. Nobody's saying it's likely. I mean, we're going over outlier cases. Whatever the, the likelihoods, tripping and falling and dying, his body would have been found or drowning in the river. That's a likely scenario of somebody that had an accident. Those likely scenarios are the cases that are solved. So the cases that are unsolved, sometimes a certain percentage of them have unlikely outcomes. This isn't rocket science. Another possibility is if this farmer himself was a drug user, he might have thought he was being attacked by some random kid just walking through his field. So if he's high on drugs, he doesn't know what's going on. He accidentally kills him or whatever. He kills him in a drug stupor. Then the next day, he's like, wow, what have I done? He would clean up his own mess. Someone well-versed in farm equipment apparently said this. Plenty of documented cases where individuals have killed and disposed of bodies on their own property. Farmers have heavy equipment too, so he's probably about 20 feet down in soil thanks to a backhoe. Gotta stay on the road, kids. And is this a backhoe that cadaver dogs hit on? The other thing too, if, if the McGuire theory is true and the farmer just stumbled across the body at whatever point in the morning, did they then just use the backhoe or whatever equipment to bury him deep in the field just, you know, to avoid the mess? I mean, is that more likely than an alien abduction? Would also be curious if the farmer would allow some kind of ground-penetrating radar or a non-disruptive search, because obviously they don't want their crops ruined digging up all the fields and everything. But if they're innocent, would they object to ground-penetrating radar that wouldn't disrupt the field too much. And then, of course, brain fingerprint scanning is something I talk about as well. Uh, obviously, polygraph tests, not admissible in court, not that reliable, but brain fingerprint scanning, this is what was used on Steve and Alan Avery of making a murderer fame, where there was no, it basically just measures whether or not there's a familiar with response in the brain. So the state's case, there was no such response in Stephen Avery's brain, so nothing, this, everything the state said about what happened is not recognized by Avery's brain. So he has no idea what they're talking about. So even if he did kill Teresa Hallback, it's definitely not in the manner that, the, that he was uh, convicted of doing. 
that much is clear. Nobody's fooled the brain fingerprint scan technology. I think there's a hundred or $150,000 reward for beating it because it bypasses any intention to deceive. It basically just measures if there's any recognition in brain wave responses to information being presented. This is what's used by the CIA and the upper government agencies in interrogations and such because it is so accurate. I think it was used in at least one court case, but then everything's kind of gone quiet on the brain fingerprint scan side of things. Is that by design? Because a lot of corrupt politicians, corrupt law enforcement, corrupt judges, they don't want it being used against them. So they just want to outlaw it outright. I don't know. But if this farmer consented to a brain fingerprint scan and consented to ground penetrating radar used on his field, then we can rule him out. But if he's opposed to all this, because obviously it's very valid that he doesn't want his crops destroyed. You know, I mean, that's his livelihood. And he might think of it as a wild goose chase because they have no idea where this kid is. So if they come up with these scenarios that doesn't disrupt his livelihood or his field, or if there is some kind of good Samaritan billionaire out there that wants to pay him for all the damage and then some, there's really no reason for him to decline this. Someone else also posited this, if it was some kind of farming accident. Let's say, because I don't know the schedule on the farm, someone could clarify this in May. Let's say he did fall in a field somewhere, dead or alive, maybe he's still alive, and a farmer runs him over with some farm equipment killing him, or if he's already dead, simply runs him over and freaks out and then just covers the whole thing up. Is that a possibility? Because we do have to rectify. These are a lot of searches being done. This isn't the 70s. This is 2008. There's a lot of advanced equipment. The people aren't complete morons, you would think. So why hasn't his body been found? Here's an interesting write-up from a Redditor. Whole bunch of hyphen and underscores with an A and a J. My thoughts, he was plowed over. From a perspective of someone who grew up in a similar rural area, farm equipment is huge with poor sight lines. It wasn't uncommon for us to get a dead deer caught in the corn head using during harvest, even with a corn reel. I forgot what crops were nearby, but there is decent growth by the time he went missing to hide a someone who died of exposure and is just laying there. I wouldn't want anyone trampling my fields looking for some missing young adult as the farmer likely assumed it wasn't dire, and he wouldn't have noticed him in his field. When harvest came around months later, the farmer running the equipment might have not noticed the decomposed body at all, especially if the ground is rocky and uneven, so he has the corn or bean head a bit higher, and the body would be all torn up and crushed by the combine running it over. Probably enough for the farmer to not notice it's a person. When he went out again to disc the fields, or he thought it was just another deer and kept on with the same result. Or he did realize it was the kid's body at harvest time and felt so bad that he denied them the search and that he tore him all up and that he just buried him in a hole. If any above is correct, there really isn't a body to find. He could have ended up in an abandoned well or stayed in the river too, but this idea accounts for the dogs. Drunk and lost, Car is stuck, walks the wrong way, steps in the river, oh expletive, drops phone, can't find it or it's dead, wanders more in the dark. Cold, wet, dies of exposure in the field, no one noticed, farmers don't want crops trampled for nothing, decomposes all summer, gets ripped up and crushed, crushed by a combine, plowed over, done. Okay, wow, that's actually very interesting. Because if the farmer really has no idea that the kid's body is on his land, he denies the search, doesn't want his field torn up. And then there's two scenarios here. Months later, he plows over the body thinking it's e either a deer or whatever, doesn't give it a second thought because it's so many months later. Or he does realize that it's the body and covers the whole thing up. But is it plausible the farmer didn't even know that he plowed a body and it got all torn up? I mean, that's, I don't know, again, someone with more expertise in the equipment and how much of the clothes would have been. Although if the clothes got completely shredded, he might not have put two and two together. He might have just thought it was clothes that were abandoned and then and in a separate area, a dead deer or a dead animal. So he might not even have known that he plowed over a human being. That's another interesting theory. And then in that case, he would pass a brain fingerprint scan. 
But again, and there would be no remains to find if it was completely shredded. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much of the bone breakdown would occur in these um, farm machinery. But apparently the cadaver dogs did pick up his scent on a piece of farm machinery and the general area. They did not reveal exactly which farm this was on. But that's curious because that seems to fit all the variables here. And we don't need to invoke aliens or interdimensional rifts. And if the phone, the, the phone is still a curious issue, though. We do have to account for the phone location. Is it possible an animal, I don't know what kind of animals are out there, is it possible an animal would grab a phone in its mouth and possibly carry it somewhere? So let's say it, it fell next to the river. Is it possible it fell next to the river and then later, as the river banks uh, got more water, it was washed into, like, if it fell on the edge of the river, that way it didn't go dead, it continued ringing for a short time. But let's say an hour or two or five hours later, even ten hours later, whatever, before the searchers f looked at the spot where the phone was, regardless of where it was, is it possible the phone did get carried into the river at that point and the current took it far enough to where it was never found? Or is it possible that an am animal picked it up in its mouth and carried it somewhere else and the phone is somewhere? But, I mean, it's a lot harder to find a tiny little phone than it is a human being. So, I don't know. But this, this farm equipment theory is... Uh, this seems to be the leading theory at the moment from everything that I'm looking at here. I mean, the, on, the, the only other thing that might be a possibility, apparently the dog trail did continue to a gravel road, so is it possible someone picked him up and gave him a ride off that gravel road? So if he did go into the river, then he made it out of the river, then he made it to the gravel road, and someone picked him up and took him elsewhere then. I mean, that theory and the theory of being run over by farm equipment, I mean, those... These seem to be the only real ones that account for all the variables here. I mean, the phone issue still. Yeah, I mean, if he got picked up in a... I mean, I don't know. The phone... Yeah, I keep getting stuck with the phone. But the phone could be explained by simply falling at the very edge of the river, and then it could have rose enough to, to sweep the phone in, regardless of what happened after. All right, some final points here to round out this episode. Just to make sure we cover all the bases... Supposedly, again, I haven't seen this verified, supposedly all of the car doors were unlocked and open when it was found, which is kind of weird. So, some people say, oh, well, somebody stumbled upon the car and searched the car completely and then left all the doors open. I mean, that's kind of weird in the middle of nowhere. Why would somebody have done that? I mean, was that just an opportune thief? who doesn't even know who Brandon Swanson is, and they just search the car looking for valuables? I mean, was anything reported stolen from it, or if there was nothing to steal from it? I mean, that's just kind of weird. And then also, Brandon Swanson's case is on the FBI's VICAP. And again, they usually don't put cases on there unless there is foul play suspected or some kind of crime as opposed to just missing with zero evidence of a crime. So who knows? I mean, who knows why it's on there? So, I mean, FBI VICAP itself stands for Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. And, of course, Maura Murray's case was famously just added several months ago, randomly, out of nowhere. So, is this related to the farm equipment theory, where there was a violent criminal, the farmer, even if it was an unknowing violent act? I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense unless they have more information. So, the final theory I'm going to go over here, there's really nothing, to, there's no evidence for it or anything. Is it possible that Brandon Swanson was followed from one of the parties he was at. Not even necessarily by a party goer, but let's say, see, people say, oh, it's unlikely that Swanson just stumbled upon some kind of serial killer. Now, or a violent criminal in the middle of nowhere in, a, in the fields. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If there's a lot of parties going on, the semester's ending, there's a lot of parties going on, would a violent criminal and or serial killer stalk... 
certain parties where there's a lot of people maybe looking for someone to kind of get alone because that that's certainly much more plausible than a violent serial killer just randomly wandering around the fields and bumping into Swanson. Because if there was someone following him at a pretty good distance, I mean, who knows how experienced this criminal may have been, did they stumble upon his car first and then went looking for him and found him and then something happened? Again, I, I just, I think all of these avenues do need to be explored. Not necessarily that this was one of his friends or someone who knew him. Again, males are much more likely to be met with foul play at the hands of a stranger than females. But maybe it wasn't a stranger either. I mean, did they truly rule out every single individual at every single party? I don't know how thorough they did that investigation, but it didn't even necessarily have to be someone at the parties. It could have been possibly some older guy just kind of hanging around at a distance just monitoring certain parties, and he happened to follow Swanson. Again, I am not alleging that this is true or untrue. This is mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. I actually found one more post that's very relevant by Scriptor. I'm new to the case, but after reading, this is what I think happened. Given the missing two hours in the timeline and the drinking at the parties, I believe he was heavily intoxicated. He probably felt fine when he departed, but a short time later he got on the road and he fell asleep while driving and slowly came to rest at the top of the hill. This would explain the lack of damage to the car, the reason why there is a two-hour gap between the time he left the party and the time he called his parents and his confusion on his location. Given the two-hour nap, he may have been successfully able to hide the fact that he was inebriated, he was underage, and may not want to admit that to his parents. His state would also explain why he would leave the gravel road. The light is believed for him to see was a singular light, not light pointing toward a small town. This alone proves he was confused and not of his faculties. From there, I believe the O expletive came from him slipping in the water. His phone was lost to the river and he continued on the other side. His scent was tracked to another road. I sadly believe he continued on and eventually died to his exposure. An open space at night can be extremely disorienting even more if you are inebriated. I wish the family could get some closure. Of course, this person does not account for the, uh, the body not being found, uh, but in terms of the two-hour gap, I don't know if we went over that. So apparently there's two hours missing from when he left the party to when he called the parents interesting. So where was he that whole time? Was it really just a nap? A drunk nap? Hmm... Other people stated that uh, the, the reason why nothing was heard on the other end of the phone if he accidentally hit mute on the phone or if he's bumping into a fence and he drops the phone and the phone is on the other side of the fence and he can't find it after that, so he just continues on. I mean, I don't know. But this two-hour gap is curious. Another thing I found uh, on the Brandon Swanson subreddit, supposedly users here have stated that there was extensive searching with metal detectors. So the phone was never found. So they specifically looked for the phone as well as Brandon. So that's something that's very, very curious. Very, very curious indeed. So that's it for now. All the Mind Shock listeners out there, leave your own thoughts and theories on this very baffling case. What you believe happened, why or why not, and what the evidence tells us, what the cell phone issues tell us. If you enjoy the Mind Shock podcast and want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Like and share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcaster requests. You can also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. And make sure you subscribe to the channel to get the latest updates on cases. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.